We are going to turn to the scriptures now. At the beginning of January, we started a series that I'm calling Reasons to Believe, Thoughtful Answers to Common Obstacles to Faith. And uh, last week, we looked at some things related to suffering in the world and how suffering can be an obstacle to people coming to faith and some ways to maybe respond to that. And before that, we talked about kind of scientific evidence that there is a creator and how we can make sense of that. And, you know, as I've been putting this material together, uh, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking of three people in particular. I'm thinking of the person who maybe is seeking and has, is facing some of these obstacles to faith and wondering if there are any, you know, thoughtful ways to respond to the, the challenges or the obstacles that they have in coming to faith. So it's for the seeker. It's also for the person who maybe believes but is wondering, you know, I've committed my life to this thing, but is there sort of thoughtful, kind of reasonable answers to some of the questions that people raise and how do I respond to those things and the third one is for people who have folks in their lives whom they care about very much and want them to come to know the Lord and maybe in their conversations with them they don't know where to start and so I'm hopeful that this will be kind of some resources that you can use as conversation starters so if you are any one of those three people I hope this morning's talk will be helpful to you and if you're here and you just, I just love the Lord and I believe in the Lord and I don't need to know why, well, then I hope that this will be just an encouragement for other reasons too. But at any rate, we are going to look at Matthew chapter 28 today and we're going to be reading verses 11 to 14. So if you'd like to turn to your Bible now, we will read together Matthew chapter 28 verses 11 to 14. And today's message is all about the reasons that Christians believe in the resurrection. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And the story has been widely circula circulated among the Jews to this very day. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. So, Back when I lived in Alberta, there was this guy in our church named Dave. Dave was a farmer from really solid Mennonite stock, and as such, he liked to keep things pretty simple and straightforward when it came to his faith. That is to say, he simply knew what he believed, and he was prepared to tell folks why whenever they asked. Like one time, for instance, someone at work asked him, they said, like, Dave, why bother with Christianity when really all of the religions are basically the same? Dave was telling me about this after the fact, and he said, you know, I told him, I said, you give me any other founder of any other world religion, and I'll show you his tomb. Moses, Muhammad, Buddha, I mean, we can visit any one of their grave sites today. Jesus is the only one with an empty tomb. He walked away from the grave. And I guess, he said, I guess if I had to make my choice, I would choose the faith with the empty tomb. As I say, Dave liked to keep things pretty simple when it came to his faith. Although I should point out that it's not entirely true what he said that day. I mean, we do know where the prophet Muhammad is buried. You can go and visit his grave in the city of Medina, Saudi Arabia. With Moses, it's a little bit complicated because the Bible says that he was buried on Mount Nebo, but no one knows exactly where on Mount Nebo it was. With the Buddha, it's even more complicated because after his death, they cremated his body and placed the remains in these special monuments called stupas all over the place. And so, for instance, you can visit the shrine of the Buddha's tooth in Sri Lanka, if you want, but there's no specific burial site for Buddha. 
But Dave's main point, I think, it still stands, right? The resurrection is unique. This claim, I mean, that this first century Jewish holy man was buried, and then on the third day he rose again from the dead. The, the fact of the empty tomb does set Christianity apart. And it always has. There, there is one place in the Bible, for instance, where a guy named Paul put it like this. He said, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. You, you see, right from the very beginning, this was the central conviction of the first Christians. Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he was dead and buried, and then the third day he rose again from the dead. And as far as Matthew is concerned, that the guy who wrote our text today, I mean, as far as he is concerned, people have been trying to explain away the empty tomb ever since. Of course, this brings us at last to our third common obstacle to faith, this claim that Jesus rose from the dead in bodily form, right, as a historical event that took place in space and time. Because I will be the first to admit that de dead people tend to stay dead <laughs> as a rule of thumb. And they certainly don't rise from the dead as a matter of everyday events. And so... Is there any good reason to believe that Jesus did? It's actually a very good question. And it's the reason that we are reading this particular passage this morning. Because this very strange sidebar in the book of Matthew explaining how the chief priests made up a story about how the body was stolen and how they bribed the guards to spread that story around. As we will see in a minute, this 2,000-year-old conspiracy theory <laughs> is actually pretty compelling evidence that, however it happened to get that way, the tomb was, in fact, empty. But before we get there, let me point out one little bit of historical evidence for the empty tomb that you and I might not appreciate since we're reading about it some 2,000 years later. But if we had lived in the culture that Matthew lived in, in the ancient Roman Empire, it would stand out to us as a sore thumb. You see, in verse 11, it says, while the women were on their way, the women, of course, being Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who were the first to visit the tomb that very first Easter morning. And they were the first ones, actually, to discover that it was empty. And in verse 11 there, they are on their way to tell the other disciples, just like Jesus told them to do, making them the very first witnesses of the resurrection. So, how is that historical evidence that the tomb really was empty? Well, what if I told you that women could not be witnesses in the legal sense in the ancient Roman Empire, in, in the culture that Matthew was writing in? Now, just bear with me for a second. But let's remind ourselves that, you know, 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire was a highly patriarchal society, right? Men had the power and women, it is sad to say, but it is true, women were disrespected and disregarded and treated like second class. And in their world, in the Roman world, women were literally not allowed to give testimony in court because in their world, in the Roman world, the testimony of a woman was considered invalid and unreliable. So, the fact that the early Christian account of the resurrection, and all of the accounts of the resurrection that we have, they all agree on this point. They all note it down that it was a group of women specifically who were the first to witness the resurrection. And this would have made their story seem like hogwash to the Romans. 
In fact, this is one of the first criticisms of the Christian message that we have on record. In 176 AD, a Roman writer named Cellus wrote this scathing critique of the Christian story. Quote, but who really saw it? He says, the supposed resurrection of Jesus, a hysterical women, as they admit, and perhaps maybe one other person. Now, those are his words, not mine, <laughs> for all the women in the room. <laughs> but, what does it tell you, 2,000 years later, that when Matthew wrote his gospel, he carefully noted it down, that it was women, actually, who were the first witnesses of the resurrection. Even though he must have known that this little detail would have shredded the credibility, credibility of his story in the eyes of his Roman readers. I don't know about you, but it tells me that he was not making it up. Because if he was going to make up a story about a resurrection and he wanted it to be convincing, Matthew never, ever would have put woman at the tomb first. Not in his world he wouldn't have. And made them the first witnesses. Not if he wanted his made-up story to be credible. <laughs> he sure wouldn't have. And so whatever else you can say about this passage today, at the very least, it seems like Matthew believes that it happened the way it happened. Not that it proves that on its own, doesn't prove that Jesus rose from the dead, but it certainly suggests that Matthew was convinced he had. And that he was not willing to alter any of the details of the story, even if by doing so, he could have made the story more believable to the people he was telling it to. Of course, Matthew 28, verses 11 to 14, actually gives us even more compelling reasons to believe than just that. You see, the chief priest's plan in this passage, like in a bizarre twist of historical irony, their little conspiracy theory to explain away the resurrection is actually a fascinating little bit of evidence that the tomb really was empty. I mean, just, just think about it for a second. Matthew is probably writing his gospel sometime around 60 AD or so, so roughly speaking, some 30 years after the events in question. And even if you doubt every single word that he has written here, you still have to deal with the fact that he thinks it's necessary to explain how a story like this got started. Quote, they said, the chief priest said, the disciples came and stole the body. And the fact that he's included a bit explaining how a rumor like that got started, doesn't that suggest that that's actually what people in his day were saying? Like, like why include a sidebar explaining how the, body got, how the rumor that the body got stolen, how that got started, if there was no stolen body rumor going around to begin with? But, but if that's the case, then what does it tell you? The fact that this was the rumor going around in Matthew's day. The fact, I mean, that this was the line that people took to refute the Christian claim that Jesus rose from the dead. That, that they were saying, Jesus wasn't resurrected, the disciples came and stole his body. Instead of saying something like, Jesus wasn't resurrected, the body's still there where we left it. Are, are you picking up what I'm laying down here? <laughs> if the tomb wasn't empty, couldn't they just have produced the body to refute the story? I mean, that would have been a whole lot easier, wouldn't it have? And less expensive from the sounds of verse 12 there. And the fact that this is not the problem that Matthew is trying to address, you know, people saying that the body was still in the tomb, the fact that 30 years later Matthew is dealing with the problem of an alternative explanation for the empty tomb. I mean, 
taken strictly as historical data, I personally find that pretty strong evidence that whatever actually happened to the body, the tomb was empty. T too many people had too much at stake for them not to have produced the body of Jesus if they could have done. But they didn't. Presumably, because they couldn't. And like I say, people have been trying to explain away the empty tomb ever since. Because those chief priests were the first ones to offer an explanation, but they have hardly been the last, right? I mean, especially in our time, after 2,000 years of, of scientific discoveries have sort of taught us to assume that the world is a closed system, right? Where, where the only things that can happen are the things that have always happened. We, we've sort of floated all sorts of theories to try to explain how that tomb got Empty, like theories that make the chief priest's stories sound downright plausible. <laughs> you know, when they ask us to believe that four highly trained centurions fell asleep, even though, for the record, falling asleep on duty was punishable by execution in the Roman army. And then the disciples came, they say, in the dark <laughs> and rolled away a two-ton stone that sealed the tomb. They rolled it away, mind you, without ever waking up those four sleeping centurions. And then they slipped away with the body. I mean, there have been theories that make that story sound downright plausible. One theory, which first surfaced sometime around the 1800s, was the idea that Jesus did not actually die on the cross at all. He just sort of fell unconscious from the pain, and the disciples buried him, kind of mistakenly assuming that he was dead. This theory, if you're taking notes, is sometimes called the swoon theory, as in Jesus just swooned on the cross, but he didn't really die. And the idea is that, you know, Later, the tomb, he revived, and he came out alive, and the disciples just started talking about that event as though he had been resurrected. It's a theory. Of course, if it were true, it, it would mean that somehow the Roman soldiers brought a man down off the cross before he was dead, despite the fact that they were extensively experienced at dispatching people by crucifixion. And it would also mean that after his ordeal on the cross, Jesus still had the strength, right, to roll aside a two-ton tombstone and alone from the inside of the tomb. And also that the sight of this broken, bleeding Jesus, fainting and on the verge of death, was actually the kind of thing that would inspire his disciples to worship him forever after? Well, it's just a theory, <laughs> And there's been other theories, too. And if we had the time this morning, we could go through each one case by case. But this is a sermon, not a history lesson, so let's try to boil things down here, okay? Because most of the efforts to try to explain the empty tomb come down to three basic suggestions. Either the disciples were mistaken, or they were speaking symbolically and didn't mean a literal resurrection or they were actually part of some huge conspiracy to make people think that Jesus was risen when in fact he wasn't. Either the tomb, the empty tomb, is a mistake, a myth, or a machination, which is a hard word to say, but they all lined up with M, so bear with me. <laughs> a machination, a lie, a mistake, a myth, or a lie. And so I've already mentioned some early Christian writings which suggest that whatever else they thought they were doing, the early Christians did not think they were speaking symbolically when they said that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll quote Paul again. If he wasn't raised, Paul said, then our faith is, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. As for the idea that the disciples were simply mistaken, I mean, it is possible, but it is not too likely, I don't think. I mean, there was enough riding on this outrageous claim 
that someone could have taken the time to double check the facts. And, and anyways, there were enough specific eyewitnesses mentioned by name in the New Testament that it would not have been that hard to have verified their report. And so that leaves us with one possibility. That the priests actually got the story straight. And the whole thing was just some clever machination, a, a conspiracy on the part of the disciples, I mean, who, who somehow got rid of the body and fabricated this story about a resurrection. A conspiracy, mind you, that they kept secret to their dying breath? Which is possible, I suppose. But then again, on March 1st, 1974, Charles Colson was indicted for his part in the Watergate scandal. No one want to slam on the brakes there? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know you're thinking, what, what does the Watergate scandal have to do with a 2,000-year-old story about an empty tomb? Well, in 1972, five men were arrested for a failed burglary attempt on the Democratic Party's headquarters in the Watergate office building in Washington, and ever since, it's been known as the Watergate scandal. The burglars, it turns out, had been funded by the Republican president, Richard Nixon's administration, and the investigation into this burglary turned up all sorts of illegal goings-on in the president's office. The, the Watergate scandal eventually forced President Nixon to resign and sent no less than 43 people to jail. Chuck Colson was one of President Nixon's advisors at the time. He was known as the president's hitman, I think was his nickname. And on March 1st, 1974, he pled guilty to obstruction of justice for trying to cover up the Watergate scandal. He received a three-year prison sentence, and it just so happens that right before his indictment, Chuck Colson became a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's a fascinating story. Later on in his life, he would write about the spiritual impact that Watergate had on him. In one place, he talks about how, how quickly everyone's efforts to cover up the Watergate scandal fell apart. How quickly it happened because the men involved buckled under the pressure and just started turning each other in to save their own skins. Quote, I'm quoting Colson here. The serious cover-up began on March 21st, 1973, and it ended on April 8th, 1973, after a mere two-week investigation. He says, with the most powerful office in the world at stake, a small band of hand-picked loyalists, meaning himself and the other nine members of Nixon's inner ring, none of us could hold a conspiracy together for more than just two weeks. Colson talks about all of the power and the prestige that came along with his position. And then he simply observes that it was not enough incentive to make this group of men contain a lie. And then he just applies this idea, or rather this observation, to the idea that the tomb was empty and that it was really some sort of conspiracy on the part of the disciples. Could it be, he says? Well, it could be, but then we would have to believe that each disciple was willing to be ostracized by their family and friends, was willing to live in daily fear of death and endure prisons, torture, and ultimately die, all for a lie that they knew was a lie without anyone ever once renouncing the claim. This is why the Watergate scandal is so instructive for me, he says. If we were so panic-stricken, not by the prospects of beatings and execution, but just by the political disgrace and the possible prison terms, then one can only guess about the emotional state of those disciples. Unlike the men in the White House, they were powerless. <laughs> and underprivileged, 
and yet they clung tenaciously to their enormously offensive story. Okay, I don't know how convincing you find Chuck Colson's logic there, but it's always sort of stuck with me. He says, taken from someone who saw firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up really is, nothing less than a real encounter with the resurrected Jesus could have caused those men to maintain to their dying day that Jesus is alive. I would like to just close with that line today. Partly because, I mean, if, if it was not a machination, a lie, and it wasn't a myth, and it wasn't a mistake, then it kind of leaves one option open, doesn't it? At least for me, it does. That the tomb really was empty. Because the Lord Jesus really did rise again. And if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and you believe in your heart that he did, the Bible says, you will be saved. This is the gospel. But that's not the only reason or even the primary reason I want to end with Mr. Colson's reflections on Watergate. It's the way he said that last line there. Nothing less than a real encounter with the resurrected Jesus could have caused those men to maintain to their dying day that Jesus is alive. You see, I am fully aware <laughs> that none of the evidence I have mentioned up here today closes the case on the question of the missing body. At least for every point that I have made, I personally can think of all of the rebuttals that I myself would make to the things that I have just said before I was a believer. And even though I have tried to give some very careful kind of historical reasons to believe the message, I fully acknowledge that there will always be ways to explain it away if we want to. And all the historical evidence in the world, on its own, none of that will tip the scales of doubt and disbelief. In fact, if you're anything like me, the historical evidence will only really be convincing to you after you believe. N not before. It, it kind of works that way. Only a real encounter with the resurrected Lord will convince us that he is alive. And so, if I can, I would like you to sort of just sweep away the last 20 minutes of evidence that I laid out for you. That was a lot of work to just sweep it away, but we'll do it today. Especially if you are here as a seeker today. I would encourage you to seek that a real encounter with the resurrected Lord. That is certainly what tipped the scales for me. And I've shared this story before, so I won't dwell on it, but I've told you how I had been raised in a Christian home, right? And I had been taught the gospel right from a kid, but up through my young adult years, I sort of went through this period of drifting and wandering where I was not really sure what my belief system included, but I was pretty sure that it did not have much room for a literal resurrection. And it's a long story to tell, but after my wife Danny and I were married, we got connected to a little country church out in rural Alberta where we really loved the community and the pastor was a sweet, gentle soul and we really sensed something real there whenever we went. But even so, the scales in my heart had not tipped yet. And then one day, like, like six months into our time at this little church, I was sitting there, kind of right there where we're sitting now, <laughs> in the front row. And the pastor, he said something sort of offhand about how Jesus is the resurrected Lord, the Savior of the world. He did not give any historical evidence that it was true, per se. He just simply said it, that the Savior of the world is the resurrected Lord. Lord. 
And all of a sudden, I was standing at a crossroads, you know? There was like this one voice in my heart. It was my voice, and it sort of said something like, well, Dale, you used to believe that when you were a kid. But you're an educated adult now. And you're much too sophisticated to swallow a pill like that. And the other voice, and to this day I have no doubt in my heart whose voice it was. The other voice said, Listen, Dale, either you believe or you don't, but you can't sit on the fence anymore, and you got to stop living a lie. You have to make your choice. And Whitby Church, that was the day for me when the resurrection stopped being an abstract historical question for me and became a lived reality. And if I may, let me humbly suggest that this is what we, all of us, need if we want to be sure of the resurrection. We need to say yes to the voice of Jesus. And we need to let him convince us that he is alive. I'm going to invite the worship team to come and lead us in some songs as we respond to what we've heard this morning. And let's pray as they find their spot. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people, is how the scriptures say it. We can trust that by your spirit you are here, present even now, that you are at work in our hearts. We ask you to apply this message to whatever doubts or questions we may be wrestling with today, and we ask for a sure sign from you in this moment that you truly are alive. You rose from the dead. And you are holding out to us the sure promise of eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.